12.30, and we are keen to keep on schedule at 12.30, it will be the Ballantyne's presentation, but right now it is a pleasure to welcome Ian McCann. Ian is a geotechnical engineer for Geotech Consulting Limited. Uh, they have assessed central city building sites and have provided advice on foundations for 25 years. Uh, Ian does have a PowerPoint presentation. Please welcome Ian McCann. Well, what has geotechnical engineering got to do with visions for the central city? So I wind back 40 years. I was at my last year at high school and I was heading for university and an engineering course. But I found myself attending a series of lectures by Charlie Challenger, who was the very first lecturer who set up the landscape architecture course at Lincoln University. And um, I got very excited, and for a long period of my life, I thought that engineering would simply be a stepping stone through to something else. But as fate would have it, I find myself instead dealing with the things that are generally out of sight and out of mind until an earthquake comes along and suddenly we all become experts in liquefaction and uh, seismic waves and all sorts of esoteric subjects that we'd never heard of before. But one of the things that excited me about landscape architecture when I first encountered it was the very holistic view that they, the, the approach to a, to a problem and a situation. The basis of it was to actually investigate what is there, what have you actually got, what makes the things about this place special, what is unique about this. You can go and level a, a patch of ground and build a mini New York City anywhere in the world if you want to, but do we want a mini New York City here, do we want a mini Los Angeles? What's unique about Christchurch? So as part of that input, we actually have to think about the environment, both the cultural environment and also the physical environment. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about one aspect of the physical environment that's come into prominence in the last few months. And I'll start by going back to Christchurch as it was when the, those of us of European origin first arrived. So this is part of the so-called black map of of 1856, and I'm sh showing here just the, the section on the inter inner city. There's Cathedral Square, Hagley Park, Fitzgerald Ave, Beely Ave. Now one of the questions is why was Christchurch built right here? And the answer is that when Captain Thomas came to set out the, set out the city, that was as far up the Avon as you could get with any boat. So there was access through to Sumner and through to Littleton. And the other thing was that in this area here, he found the first patch of relatively dry ground in the swamp that was most of Christchurch at that time. We'll also see on this map some of the features which Dilucas has talked about, these little stream channels which wander through what is now the middle of the city. So now we go below the surface and this is what we find. This is a cross-section through Christchurch from roughly the airport out this side and South Brighton and the beach out here. And in the middle is Cathedral Square and the Central Business District. So the blue areas are layers of silt and clays. The white bits in between are essentially gravels. And up the top in the hatched area are the areas of sand and silts, fine-grained soils. And you'll see there that the central district, business district, is right at the edge of where the gravels are relatively shallow. So if you go out to the west port, uh, out west towards the airport, you're essentially sitting on good gravels. And if you head east, you head out into the sand country, liquefaction land. And the CBD is sitting pretty much on that transition. This is a portrait of only the top 150 metres of ground. If you keep on going down, we have the same sequence pretty much all the way down to about 800 metres. And at that point under the central city, we find the, the volcanics from the Littleton volcano. That's sitting on top of probably limestones and siltstones. And underneath at probably 1.2 or 1.5 kilometres depth, we finally get down to the basement grey wacky rock. 
This is, of course, some, of some significance because the earthquake shaking coming up through the sequence of soils at every interface, the properties of the gravels are different to the properties of the silts and clays. So at the interface, you get some reflection and some refraction of the um, earthquake waves coming through. So it gets very complicated pattern by the time you get to the surface. And this is why in some parts of the city we've had very little shaking and buildings have, have come through unscathed. And in other parts, the buildings are very badly damaged because the shaking from underneath is variable across the city. So we've got 800 metres of materials which one can hardly call solid earth. It's actually a little bit on the soft side. So these are just a couple of shots from the inner city of what the ground has been doing. This is where the tram track turns off Armagh Street into New Regent Street. The whole of the tram track is built on a very strongly reinforced concrete base. It's very stiff and rigid. The ground around, even though we think it's solid, is not so stiff and rigid. So in Armagh Street there appears to have been some movements in the east-west direction the, you can't pick it up on the ground, all you see is some narrow cracks in the asphalt. But at this point, it's all concentrated because the tram track takes a curve round, and so it pushes against the ground. And it's moved something like 200 millimetres against the ground to the east. Armagh Street, earlier on, we saw a, a photograph of two buildings which aren't quite perpendicular anymore. And this is at the bottom of them. You can see here how the road has pushed together and pushed the asphalt up. And between the buildings you can probably just make out there's some, some timber um, dwangs to hold up what was formerly a board there. And by measuring that you can tell that the buildings have moved together by about 80 millimetres and they've moved relative to each other vertically by about 130. We still don't quite know which building's gone down and which building's gone up, but that's we think we're standing on solid ground, but comes an earthquake and it's not really quite that good. We've also had liquefaction in parts of the city, central city. So that's a deposit of liquefied sand that's half a metre thick around the back of an apartment building further west again in Armagh Street. And here's a building in Armagh Street. This one is piled. And the photograph on the, um, the top right there, you can see how the ground beams connecting the, the tops of the piles are now sitting proud of the ground. The ground has dropped around a third of a metre compared to where it was um, on the 21st of February. The back of the, the building, the ground profile under there is rather different, and at that point the ground's only gone down about half as much. And we've also got a little bit of lateral spread in the central city. What we're finding out in the east part of Christchurch, we've got on a smaller scale in the inner city, that's an Oxford Terrace near Price Waterhouse, and the, um, the river bank has moved probably three quarters of a metre towards the river. So here's a map of part of the inner city area. Um, the red zoning is mapped by the university of where the surface manifestation of liquefaction. So you can see a band running right across through there, which probably reflects something about an old river channel of the Waimak from years ago. And that's an area where there's been liquefaction of a reasonable extent. Down in the bottom right corner, you can see the top of another area of liquefaction which extends out to the southeast towards AMI Stadium and Ferry Road. And there's less liquefaction on the southwest where those yellow patches are. We can also say something a little bit about the variability of the soil types under the central city because it's not uniform everywhere. Up in the top here, the northwest up in Victoria Street, we've essentially got um, very soft soils with layers of peat down to about eight or nine metres. In the northeast, up in the upper Manchester Street, Madras Street, we've again got soft soils down to a similar sort of depth. In the south east and the east, we've got a similar situation, lenses of peat, soft silts, compressible material. If you put a heavy weight on it, the ground will, will consolidate underneath and the building will go down. And then on the west side of the, of the city, over here, from about Colombo Street west through into Hagley Park, we've got a gravel layer at quite a shallow level. So there's some variability on an aerial extent. And then when we look at a cross-section, we see an even more complicated picture. Um, this is an old 
transparency, I'm afraid I didn't have time to put lots of pretty colours on it, so I'll explain it through. Up on, the, up on the top here, the white background is basically sands, silty sands and silts. The grey area is essentially sand. The stippled areas are essentially gravels. So what we have here is quite a lot of variation. This is a cross-section through the middle of town from the Carlton Mill corner, Bailey Avenue, Victoria Street here, runs down Victoria Street, through Cathedral Square, and ends up at this end, down at the Polytech site. So it's diagonally through the middle of the city. So this presents us with some difficulties when it comes to engineering the foundations for buildings. The first thing is that we've got a very high groundwater level. If you dig a hole a couple of metres deep anywhere in the middle of town, it'll start filling up with water, which means that when we start constructing at any depth, we have to deal with groundwater and sometimes quite large flows. We've got highly variable soils, particularly in the top um, six to eight metres. There's a building I know where the back is sitting on gravel at six metres depth and the front is on piles down to 22 metres and that's in the length of one building. We've got liquefiable sand layers sometimes near the surface, as in the area that we, we looked at on the, on the plan, but also at greater depths as well. So it may be that you think you're putting a pile down to a nice solid layer, but if you go another couple of metres below it, you might find that there's some sand which will liquefy in a big enough earthquake. We've got black gravel layers interspersed throughout this mix, and some of the gravel, unfortunately, is quite loose, and we're now discovering that loose gravels and earthquakes they respond as well. We're getting settlements in the gravels, which I at least hadn't expected. We've got lenses of peat and soft silt and buried logs all through the whole mix. And right down the bottom, we've got an artesian layer that's down at around 23, 25 metres under pretty much the whole of the central city. This is our, the first of the artesian aquifers, so this is a water supply source. And so there's concern here that we have to make sure that we don't get leakage of this upwards or contamination of, of um, shallow groundwater, which tends to be a bit dirty, down into this layer. So when it comes to engineering, we have to think carefully before we put anything down that deep. So what do we do as engineers? Well, if we've got good ground close to the surface, we can put in a shallow foundation, and then we build on top of that. So there are a lot of buildings in the west part of the central city which are like that. The police station, the art gallery, the new civic buildings, Clarendon Towers, Price Waterhouse, Forsyth Bar, are all built on that sort of foundation. Elsewhere, where the ground's not so good, we go deep. So we put in piles. We either drive them, which was commonly done until about 10, 15 years ago, and then people started objecting to the noise and vibration, so nowadays we tend to make a hole on the ground and fill it up with concrete instead. And then on the top of our piles we build our buildings. So there are engineering solutions which you adopt to what particular ground profile we're working on. So the foundations can be engineered. We can put in deep piles where we need to. Maybe after this earthquake, shallow foundations, shallow pads, might go out of fashion a little bit and maybe we'll be looking at more rafts where we basically have a very large concrete, thick concrete um, pad under the entire building. And in places we might look at ground improvement to try and, particularly in the liquefiable areas, to try and, and make the ground no longer susceptible to liquefaction. So in summary, some little hints here in terms of where we go forward from the geotechnical perspective. First of all, the foundations in Christchurch generally, with the odd exception, have worked well for many years. There have been very few failures, particularly in the central area, where buildings have suffered dramatically because of problems with the foundations. But this earthquake has exposed some weaknesses. We've seen that some of the buildings have tilted. It's not a desirable result. So we're looking at how can we do things better in some areas to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen so that an otherwise good building can remain there and not face the prospect of demolition simply because it's tilted. 
So as an engineer, of course, we can say, we can do anything. If you pay me enough money, I can do anything for you. 